at the end of a storm There's a golden sky And the sweet silver song of love Walk on through the wind Walk on through the rain For your dreams be tossed and Sul cross di Riverino, colpo di testa di Pelé e il Brasile in vantaggio. Ha segnato Pelé al diciottesimo minuto. Redna. Goodness me, have you ever seen anything like that in your life from a goalkeeper? Isn't football such a beautiful sport? Corruption in FIFA has been a very common subject as far as football topics. The allegations of corruption in FIFA are plenty and have its beginning since the year 2000. The current accusations have dragged football to its darkest side with Sepp Plata in the presidency. These accusations have just recently come to public knowledge, but there were no news for the investigative reporter Andrew Jennings, who was pioneer in showing what FIFA really is. For the purpose of this documentary, we've headed ourselves to the headquarters of The Guardian to meet one of the most informed and expert journalists on corruption in FIFA, Owen Gibson, who is the chief sports correspondent at The Guardian. 
On the interview, Owen Gibson gave his first impressions about corruption in FIFA and why he started to cover this subject. Well, it's been bubbling under the surface for years. There's been allegations of corruption and mismanagement at FIFA by uh, journalists like Andrew Jennings, who wrote Foul, David Yallop wrote a book called uh, How They Stole the Game all the way back in 2000. So these allegations have been chipping away for years at FIFA. It's only really when the um, 2010 World Cup uh, vote was taken that I think most people really woke up to the, to the extent of the problem. And in the five years since, it's grown and grown until we've obviously seen the events of this year and the FBI raids and so on. So, I mean, we've been coming at The Guardian uh, all the way through, but it's not a subject that it's always um, easy to uh, attack because you need to have information that kind of is obviously not readily available. And it's only really once the, um, the FBI investigation came to uh, head that we were able to uh, really uncover what had been going on there all these years. I think that, you know, the allegations have always been there. Some of us have been writing about it for an awful long time and we've always felt that things need to change. But it's one of those organisations where it's very difficult to come across the uh, agents to create that change. I mean, uh, journalists can criticise it from the outside. Some football uh, organisations or individuals will occasionally criticise FIFA and what it stood for and what went on there. But the system was so strong and there was no way that any external government could really challenge it. Therefore, people, I think, start to shrug their shoulders and think there was no way of it changing. As I say, it was only when the, the FBI got seriously involved and also when uh, FIFA finally began to sort of crumble under its own weight after these... Um, extraordinary World Cup votes in 2010, which took the World Cup to Russia, then to Qatar, that I think, you know, you start to see cracks in that sort of FIFA edifice, and that's when things start to change. So, you know, we all want, a lot of us wanted it to change for a long time, but it was hard to find what the means to do that was. But the Guardian's chief sports correspondent made very clear that FIFA is not the only organization who is corrupted. Yes, yes absolutely. I mean, every, you know, all the evidence would suggest that, that FIFA is corrupt, but you have to be careful in the sense as well, because it's not only FIFA that's corrupt, it's all the confederations that make up FIFA that are corrupt. So a lot of the uh, recent allegations have involved CONCACAF, which is the North and Central uh, American Confederation, and CONMEBOL, which is the South American Federation. Um, so it goes all the way down the tentacles of world soccer. It's not just FIFA at the top that the league performing, it's the whole of the pyramid. Out of the last World Cup five editions, only the World Cup 2002 in South Korea has not been submitted to investigation, as the 2010 World Cup in South Africa is one that got the most accusations regarding bribery and racketeering. Other corruption allegations came to public when former FIFA executive Chuck Blazer pleaded guilty of facilitating the payment of a bribe on the World Cup 1998 in France. Blaza also admitted on his trial that initially he and his FIFA colleagues accepted a $1 million bribe to vote for Morocco to host the World Cup 2010, but this bid was overcome by a $10 million bribe from South Africa, who won the campaign to host the 2010 World Cup. Some of Blaza's colleagues were FIFA's former Vice President Jack Warner, was also involved on a World Cup TV rights deal with former FIFA president Sepp Plata, making a profit of $11 million in 2010 and 2014, and former FIFA General Secretary Jerome Valk also being investigated by selling World Cup tickets for higher values. The 2014 World Cup in Brazil was one of the most controversial and criticized by media and general public, as Brazil was going through a period of economic crisis, the government decided to host a World Cup even though they admitted not to have money to invest on healthcare and education facilities. Hosting the World Cup cost to Brazil 5 to 8 billion pounds, and most of these costs were not supported by FIFA, which led to a wave of protests in Brazil's streets. This World Cup is also under FBI investigation due to former Brazilian football chief Ricardo Texera links with former FIFA General Secretary Jerome Valk. The problem was not so much taking the World Cup to Brazil, the problem was the economic model on which it was done. I mean, the FIFA model is that the host country bears almost all the costs. They have to build all the stadiums, put up all the infrastructure, put up all the money, and FIFA take away all the profits. And that's what people were protesting about. People were angry because, obviously, they were being expected to pay for stadiums at a time where the government wasn't investing in, in healthcare and social services and so on. And that was the cause of that anger. So it's less about the World Cup coming to Brazil. You know, Brazil is a huge football loving country, as we all know more about the model on which it was based and you know kind of, you could argue that people were right to say the World Cup to Brazil what was wrong was the model on which it was the nominations of Russia to the 2018 World Cup and Qatar to the 2022 World Cup 
are also being investigated by the FBI, as Russia became controversial after Sepp Blatter publicly affirming that it was agreed in the group that Russia would host the World Cup even before the votes, Qatar took large proportion when a whistleblower named Fahidra, who worked at the Qatar campaign, affirmed that Africa FIFA executives were given $1.5 million to vote for Qatar. Well, certainly, I mean, I've covered that whole uh, bidding process very closely, and clearly deals were done, right? I mean, trade deals were done, deals to swap votes were done, uh, deals to build training centres, deals to kind of, you know, all kinds of deals were done, but that was all part of the process. None of that was explicitly against the rules, and that was one of the problems with this dual bidding process, was that all kinds of collusion and swapping went on. Now, whether individual voters were paid for their vote is the sort of, you know, $64 million question. And that's what we still don't know. That all sorts of allegations have flown around. They've been denied by Qatar in particular and by Russia. If evidence ever emerges that individuals were paid cash for their votes, then I think at that point the decision becomes completely untenable. It's already close to untenable because most of those people who made that decision have since been proved to be either corrupt or had to resign in disgrace. And that alone should really be grounds to, to rerun the vote. And the other big question about 2018 2022 is all the focus has been on Qatar for obvious reasons because that was an extraordinary decision. People couldn't quite believe the World Cup was going to this tiny. Gulf country that you know was 45 degrees in the summer, but the Russia decision deserves just as much scrutiny. They obviously argued to Michael Garcia, the FIFA investigator, that they'd lost all their emails, that the computers had been returned, therefore they couldn't help. And it doesn't describe that scrutiny. And again, they deserve as much uh, pressure and examination as the Qataris. Owen Gibson also revealed why Sepp Blatter publicly admitted there was agreed in FIFA's group that Russia will host the 2018 World Cup. I think the tensions are twofold. One is, is now there's no, he's got nothing to lose by, by telling the truth. And I think what he was saying there, he wasn't saying that it had been stitched up before the vote. What he was saying was, he was being honest about what happened in FIFA at that time, which was the most senior members of that executive committee would have talked amongst themselves and decided that a good idea would have been to go to Russia and then go to the USA. And I, you know, I fully believe that conversation happened. His other reason for doing it is to put pressure on Michel Bettini. Uh, he constantly says it was Bettini that swung the vote towards Qatar. So he's saying, I was going to take a sensible decision, go to Russia, they go to the biggest commercial market in the United States. You know, Mr. Bettini who's to blame for going to Qatar. So that's his intention. But he sort of almost inadvertently admitted that the entire vote was a kind of advance. Owen Gibson recommended that the good way to give proofs of no manipulations on these votes is to publish the results the same way FIFA does with the best player in the world votes, where they show the amount of votes each player takes. You know, that's the one example where they're actually quite transparent. They show exactly who everyone's voted for, they show all the coaches have voted for, and you know, actually Ballon d'Or voting should be the model for the World Cup voting rather than the other way around. So bizarrely and ironically that's probably the one place where we can trust what FIFA gets up to. After these accusations in October 2015, FIFA's major sponsors, McDonald's and Coca-Cola, advised Blatter to immediately resign. But on his official statement, Blatter respectfully disagreed with FIFA's sponsors and kept his position. A decision explained by Owen Gibson. Basically because Seth Blatter's life is FIFA, I mean, it was a huge decision really for him to agree to go in the first place, but even then he wanted to do so in the manner of his own choosing, even with all this evidence massing up against his door, even with all these executives having been um, you know, arrested, you know, pulled out of Zurich, like right, the heartland of FIFA, even with all this happening, he still felt that he would be able to leave in the manner to which he thought he should, he deserved, which is really kind of in the manner of somebody who believes he has created FIFA in his own image. I mean, he's a very deluded man in many ways. He kind of, um, he still thinks that FIFA and world football revolves around him, and that's why he's clinging on to the very last minute he can. Even now, when he's agreed to resign, He's suspended by FIFA's own ethics committee and yet he's still trying to hang on until the February election. One of the most known and controversial accusations involves Sepp Blatter and former UEFA's president Michel Platini after a £1.3 million payment in 2011 from Blatter to Platini without any written proof resulting on the suspension of both from their positions. Owen Gibson explains what was behind this deal. I mean, clearly a lot of mystery still surrounds this deal. Um, 
if you believe Platini and Blatter, they, they say there's a verbal contract between them, it was money that was due to Platini uh, under the terms of their contracts in 1998. There may be some truth in that, there may well have been a verbal agreement, but as we know, you know, the rules don't say that that's enough. You can't have a verbal agreement between two men to pay that amount of money nine years later. And this goes to the heart of what the problem is with FIFA, too long to run along the lines of a um, of a sort of, you know, a mixture of the social and the personal and political, you know, it, the word of set battle was enough to pay another man 1.3 million pounds nine years later. And um, we still don't know what's at the heart of the Ethics Committee case. I understand the Ethics Committee will try and argue there was some sort of corruption there, that the did agree to do something in return for the £1.3 million. Pounds. But we can't say yet what that is uh, until we hear what the full evidence of the uh, Ethics Committee is. But there's no doubt that even on the facts of the cases we know them, there's lots about that paper that was highly irregular and, and enough to cause you know, severe question marks over the behaviour of both men. In May 2015, during a meeting in Zurich, Swiss authorities charged 14 officials, including nine FIFA executives. Amongst those who have been arrested was FIFA vice president at the time, Jeffrey Webb, accused of racketeering and money laundering. In the same month, and days before FIFA's elections, former Real Madrid player Luis Figo withdrew his run for presidency. He claimed that FIFA was corrupted and he didn't want to take part on a mission that would damage his reputation. The Dutch football administrator Van Praag also withdrew his intentions, the same way former Tottenham player David Ginola did. Owen Gibson explained why these candidates withdrew their run for president. With Figo's case, I think he knew he could win, and he saw, so that's why he withdrew a bit bluntly, and that's why he, you know, he had some strong things to say about FIFA, and he was probably right about them, but the reason he withdrew was not because he, you know, felt like his image was at threat, it was because he thought he couldn't win. And similarly with Ginola, I mean, um, he couldn't get the five nominations to required to even get onto the shortlist, so he didn't have any chance of, um, of winning. So, I mean, I think in both cases, what they said was probably right, but, that's the, but it wasn't a principal instance, it was because they, they knew they couldn't win. And, you know, I think we should be careful of, of suggesting that former players are necessarily the answer. It's when you look at Patini, obviously one of the greatest players of all time, you know, widely revered, and yet almost became, once he was caught up in that world, became almost as, as bad as the rest of them. Sepp Plato was re-elected, becoming the president with the longest period of time in the position, 17 years. However, for days after winning the elections, Blatter announced he would not candidate himself at the 2016 Extraordinary FIFA Congress in February. On that Congress, UEFA's General Secretary Gianni Infantino was elected as FIFA's new president. Owen Gibson expects changes on the organization and leaves the best wishes to the most popular sport in the world. I mean, this has to be a moment where FIFA does change the better. My fear is that once the scrutiny and the sort of the excitement around the FBI raids and the arrests and so on passes on, that we will end up with a FIFA that looks very much like the old FIFA, that we'll end up with somebody like Sheikh Salman in charge or, or one of these other characters who've all been involved in football for a reasonable amount of time. They all know how the system works and we'll end up with a version of FIFA that's maybe not as outwardly corrupt as the old one, but is a very similar version of FIFA. What I'd like to see happen is for this to be a real sort of break point where there's outside pressure put on, you get an external character brought in to, to oversee an entire reform, structural reform, and you get an entirely new kind of FIFA. You know, football is the world's most popular sport, it's loved by millions and millions of people, all the cliches about it are true, and that's why it deserves a, a global governing body that's, that's fit for a purpose. And you know, what does FIFA have to do really? It has to organise a World Cup in four years, it has to organise other competitions, and redistribute that money for the good of football. And that shouldn't be impossible, but somewhere along the way it becomes entirely corrupt. With the roller coaster of accusations and allegations over the past years, and then the new management in the most powerful football organization in the world, it is expected new measures to bring football to its right side away from corruption. All that remains to football lovers is to hope and pray for changes for the better to the beautiful game. Mario Ribeiro, Middlesex University.